Welcome to everybody that's here. We're glad you're with us today um, on behalf of the Legacy of Faith uh, Advisory Board and Bishop John Durfler. I want to welcome you all here and thank you for being here. And like always, we'd like to begin in prayer. So I'm going to turn it back over to Denise and ask her to uh, lead us in prayer this morning. And we're going to use uh, the prayer for the formation of spirit-filled evangelizers. Denise? Okay. Remember now and always, we are in the presence of God, and we lift up our prayers to him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh, Holy Spirit, come into my life and my heart. By the fire of your love, transform me and all Catholics throughout Michigan's Upper Peninsula into spirit-filled evangelizers. I pray that more and more people may come to know the love of Jesus Christ and make a personal decision to follow him. I pray for all the people who, who, huh? sorry, I got, I pray for all the people that I know who are not practicing any faith. Touch their hearts with your love, O Holy Spirit. Work through me so that they may have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ and follow him in faith. To you, O Holy Spirit, and to the Father, and to the Son, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Denise. And once again, good morning and welcome, everyone. I wanted to introduce you to your presenters today. Uh, myself, Terry Gudzinski. I'm the Director of Stewardship and Development and also the UP Catholic Foundation. And I've been working with Legacy of Faith since its inception, doing both the, the fund development and the grant making side. And Denise Foy, who you all know and love, our uh, Director of Catechesis and Adult Faith Formation, and she's our resident expert on all things faith formation. And like I said earlier, she'll be running the technology piece today. So we invite you throughout the presentation to type any questions that might pop into your head using the chat button that's in the, the lower part of your screen, or perhaps it's at the top menu bar. And Denise will be monitoring that chat, and we'll get to the questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, and in case you didn't know, I wanted to make you aware that we are recording the webinar today, and the, the recording and the accompanying handout that goes with it will also be posted on the LOF website in the days to come. So you can always get it there too. Uh, here's what our agenda looks like this morning. Uh, we think we have about a 30 minute presentation here for you and then time at the end for questions and answers. Um, but first we'll go over um, the mission of Legacy of Faith and a little bit about its history and growth over the years. That'll be a short portion, and then we'll spend the bulk of the time on grant making and review the, the timeline for Legacy of Faith, some of the important guidelines, uh, application updates for 2022. And then we have some examples of real applications and evaluations that we've received as models of uh, good content for you. And then at the end, we'll recap what we've learned um, and have time for questions and answers. And throughout the webinar, watch for the grant writing tips in red throughout the presentation. That's the whole goal today, to give you some tips. And we've made those easy for you to identify by putting them in red on the screen. So first of all, a little about the mission. Uh, the mission of Legacy of Faith is to preserve and foster the Catholic faith in the UP. When it comes to LOF, our greatest charge is to steward that mission. That's why we exist. The graphic on the bottom left shows how the mission involves first and foremost, you. And that broadly implies that it takes many people to preserve and foster the faith. Donors, priests, catechists, and people who desire to be formed in the faith. LOF became a fund of the UP Catholic Foundation in 2016. Nothing changed for LOF in terms of the mission, the assets, or the day-to-day -day operations, but now it's part of a larger family of endowment funds that all work to support the broader mission of the UP Catholic Foundation, which includes many different endowment funds supporting many different Catholic entities and their needs. The image at the bottom right of the screen is our LOF Catholic Service Award medallion. That is a program of Legacy of Faith. 
And that award was created in the spirit of LOF to bring to light individuals whose dedication and service to the church inspires others to grow in their faith. And I have to give a shout out here today to one of our webinar participants, Josie Benoit from St. Joseph and Sault Ste. Marie. She was a 2013 Catholic Service Award recipient. So I want to thank you, Josie, again, for all of the contributions you've made to the faith and inspiring others. Um, it all started Legacy of Faith with Bishop Garland when he created Legacy of Faith in 1999. He had a vision for improving and enhancing educational and social service ministries in the diocese for the long term. He conducted a major gift campaign to raise money, and he invited select people to join the Bishop's Ambassadors, which is a membership organization for major gift donors who commit $25,000 or more in support of the vision. His case for support was really compelling. He influenced people with his great passion for Catholic education and for social services. And he convinced them that the faithful need excellent programs and that those programs require substantial, consistent and permanent funding. He won over these people with his plan for Legacy of Faith to provide a stable base for that funding of these core ministries that really help to ensure that the Catholic faith is carried forward to future generations. Today, Legacy of Faith is available to all of our bishops and future bishops to continue the mission. Each bishop provides leadership and pastoral vision to an advisory board for Legacy of Faith. The bishop is ultimately responsible for approving all the LOF grants. This graph shows a snapshot of asset growth of the fund since its inception. Don't you love that upward curve? <laughs> the growth over time is a result of ongoing fundraising and new gifts received as well as investment returns. And 20, 2021 was really a momentous year for us. It was the first year that assets top $10 million. And we began our grant making program in 2002. And this graph shows the total dollar amount of grants awarded by year. You can see by the upward curve that most years show an increase in the total dollars awarded. Last year, Legacy of Faith awarded just over $320,000 and we anticipate a continuing upward curve for the next grant cycle. Legacy of Faith now has 22 years of grant making history. During that time, grants have impacted people and programs at every parish, mission and Catholic school in the diocese. Nearly 1200 grants have been awarded, totaling over $4.1 million. Legacy of Faith provides grant support in four distinct funding areas. The largest section, the orange, is Catholic schools. And each year, the Catholic schools automatically receive 50% of our total grant budget for that year. The next largest section is in blue, and that is the parish faith formation programs, which receive 30% of our annual grant budget. Then the yellow and gray sections represent 10% each, and they benefit Catholic social services of the Upper Peninsula and the Catholic Action Fund. So the blue section that you see here is the focus of today's webinar. This is the portion available for faith formation programs. For the coming grant cycle, we don't have our grant budget set yet, so I can't give you specific amounts. However, if we continue along the trend of growth, it could mean just over $100,000 total available for the blue section for faith formation. Here's our first grant writing tip. Do you see it in red at the top of the slide? We encourage you to consider these points as you begin writing your grant application. So what is grant making? Simply, it's the heart of legacy of faith. Grants are really how we achieve the mission to preserve and foster the faith. The kinds of grants that we award define who we are and what we do. Grants are effectively how LOF turns donations into direct help. Donors look at our annual grants as results of their donation investment in the mission, and teachers look at grants as help or money to help fuel the programs they want to offer. 
And for Legacy of Faith, grants are evangelization in action. The blue circle that you see on the right side shows how LOF has a perpetual nature to its mission. We accomplish the mission through a continuous cycle of three things. Beginning with the top left portion of the blue circle, it starts with gifts and donations. We are continuously inviting and accepting new gifts for LOF. The next portion of the cycle is endowment building. Once the donations come in, they are placed in the endowment and invested for long-term growth. Recall the asset graph we saw just a moment ago. The assets provide the annual grant budget. So grants then are the third portion of that cycle. We use the grant budget to achieve the mission by supporting excellent programs that form the faithful. The timeline is one of your most important tools for Legacy of Faith grants. It'll help you tremendously with your efforts to receive and manage Legacy of Faith grants. And we recommend that you place these events and dates as recurring entries on your personal or your parish calendar because you can apply every year for these faith formation grants. The beginning of a new calendar year always brings with it a window of opportunity to submit Legacy of Faith grant applications for the next parish fiscal year. The deadline is April 1, and we notify parishes by May 15th of application approval or denial. A really important tip here is to be aware of the grant guidelines. And our job here today is to help you submit your best grant application. The guidelines are part of the online grant application. So as soon as you open up the application, you'll see these guidelines. And they're also posted on our website at legacyoffaith.net. They remain fairly consistent from year to year, but we do make small tweaks each year because we are always learning something new from you. Um, and we encourage you to read this short one-page document every year. When you're aware of the guidelines, and you follow the guidelines, then your application reflects that and it naturally floats to the top. Today we'll touch on just a few of the guidelines. First and foremost, applications, which we also call proposals, um, must benefit faith formation programs at the parishes. We accept applications from parishes and also Catholic schools and other Catholic entities, but the common thread here for that blue 30% portion called faith formation is that the primary beneficiary of the program needs to be parishioners. All right, here's a few more guidelines that we tend to answer a lot of questions on. Um, a minimum of 25% local funding by the applicant is requested. Our grants really aren't intended to cover the full cost of the program or a project. However, if this guideline presents a financial hardship, then an explanation may be given. When there's demonstrated financial need, we want LOF to be able to help. Uh, grants for trips, retreats, or pilgrimages typically provide a maximum of $50 per participant. And consumable items such as food and beverages or that little hot dog that you see there on the screen, those are typically not funded. And the last one is grant approval should precede expenditures related to the project. So Legacy of Faith grants are really intended to improve and enhance programs. They're not really intended to reimburse the parishes for expenses that they've already incurred for a program. We have a few updates to the application this year, and these updates are really to help you as the applicant plan your request and submit a clear, complete and succinct application. And we make every effort to keep the application short and concise. We know your time is valuable as is ours. So we are trying to zero in on the most important information that's critical for us to effectively process the applications and get them ready for grant review. We only request data that we actually need to help us understand the request and to set you up for success. Notice the red asterisk on the form. That indicates the field is required, meaning you won't be able to submit the application until you fill in that field. However, just because a field may not be marked with a red asterisk doesn't mean that you should skip over it. 
if it helps you to submit a really clear, complete and succinct request, you should try to answer it. Describe your plan of action. We've made this a separate question this year. We used to have it combined in one question. Um, but note that on the right, just above and below the text box there, it indicates a 200 word limit. Anything over 200 words won't go through. So your description should be succinct, but it also needs to be thorough. So if you try to include the elements of who, what, when, where, and how, you should be able to fit that in 200 words or less. So if, for example, you're requesting uh, new equipment, then it should describe not only what equipment you want to buy, but also how the equipment will be used to evangelize. What programs will you present with the equipment? Who will benefit? When and where will they benefit? These are the kinds of things we're getting at here. An action plan really gives legs to your request. Having an outline of a basic plan will help you to complete the grant application quickly and easily. This doesn't mean you need to have every single detail in place. After all, you're applying for a program that's not going to take place for many months into the future. And a lot can happen between now and then. But having a basic plan outline with cost estimates and dates really helps us to understand what it is that you want to do. More tips for writing your application. Align your application with the grant focus to form spirit-filled evangelizers and anticipating the nationwide Eucharistic revival movement from 2021 to 2024, we also welcome proposals that promote a deepened understanding and a reinvigorated belief in the Eucharist. Since his ordination as our bishop in 2014, Bishop John Durfler has provided the faithful with a very simple but profoundly challenging pastoral plan for the formation of spirit-filled evangelizers. He has consistently challenged all Catholics in the Upper Peninsula to be a friend of Jesus, make a friend, and introduce your friend to Jesus. It is this pastoral vision for evangelization that really fuels the current focus for Legacy of Faith grants. In the budget section of the application, we've added a field to explain when the parish contribution is less than 25% of the program cost. Um, if your um, local funding is 25% or more, you don't need to fill out this field in the application. But if that is a hardship, we do want you to explain that to us. So what makes a good request? We always base our funding decisions on the potential of the program or project to provide quality faith formation offerings. And we lean very heavily on Denise Foy to help us understand what that quality offering is or is not. Applications that build on successful past programs or present new ideas for expansion or long range impact are also welcomed. Now we have a few slides with examples from actual applications that we've received in the past that really stood out to us. And don't panic, there's a lot of words on this slide. Not all applications are this long. And I'm not going to read all this to you, but I did want you to have a complete copy on your webinar handout so that you can go back to it later if you want. We picked this one as a good example because it stood out as innovative and it has a clear evangelization component. It's a request for customized parish clothing for parishioners to wear as they take on service work in the community. The program expands the parish partnership with our local St. Vincent de Paul Society and the t-shirts that they wear serve to identify and unite parishioners as they serve community dinners or volunteer at local food banks or make home visits. So if you look at it, it's not a novel, but it's also not one or two sentences. It's enough for us to grasp your plan and it encompasses those important points of who, what, when, where, and how. A good budget has just enough detail and not too much, not too little. So this is a good example of a budget presentation. It names a specific resource. And here, this one happens to be the Matthew Kelly's book published for Christmas. It names a quantity, 250 books, and it names a price at $2 each. 
the expenses here are equal to the income. That's something we look at. At and a good budget is um, income and expenses that, that equal out. And this one has a parish contributing 25% of the cost. So this is a really nice example of a good budget, budget presentation. This one stood out for us because it's innovative and collaborative with neighboring parishes. It helps for greater participation throughout the vicariate in the TOTUS to a summer program. This example shows how all the parishes in the Copper Country are collaborating to provide access to the TOTUS Tuist program for children in all the parish communities. Transportation is an important aspect of making sure that all students are provided the opportunity to attend. So they hold the program in a centralized parish and then they bus about 75% of the students to and from the daytime elementary program. This is a good example of an explanation, very short, very succinct, that explains a much needed upgrade. Think about the who, what, when, where, and how parameters that we talked about earlier. Not all of them are touched on in these few short sentences. And the description very quickly says, in order to better present the many programs we have and may like to get, we need new equipment. Our TVs are probably 30 years old and going bad, DVD and VHS players too. We need an update for the youth and parish weekly programs. This is a parish that has programs already, but wants to update and expand them. And more importantly, they wanna attract people to them and keep interest and present weekly programs. All right, when you accept a grant, when you deposit that grant check, that constitutes acceptance of a grant and the terms that go along with it. So for all grants, we ask that Legacy of Faith be acknowledged as a funding source on your communications and publications regarding that funded program. And that would be the logo um, that's up in the upper right-hand corner. Every LOF grant, remember this, every LOF grant awarded is the fruit of someone's donation. So when you acknowledge LOF, that's your gift back to the donors who made the grant possible. And an easy way to acknowledge LOF is just generous use of that Legacy of Faith logo. If there are any special terms or conditions placed on the grant, those are noted in your award letter and they become part of your grant. And all grantees are asked to submit an evaluation. For faith formation grants, the evaluations are always due the following June 30th. That's the end of your fiscal year. Once we approve grants, we like to pay them as soon as possible. So we pay them in July, which is the first month of your fiscal year. We pay by check and importantly, we pay when the evaluations or any prior requirements from previous LOF grants that you've received are completed. If there's any late evaluations or other information that we've requested and not yet received, that just del delays payment. So don't delay, submit your grant evaluations on time. So now that you've successfully applied for and been approved for a grant, what happens if there's a change of plans? What if you can't do the program now? What if you need to change something like the timeline or the presenter? What if you need to cancel the program? What if you don't spend all of the grant money by the end date of June 30th? Well, life happens every day. We have to go with the flow, adjust, and play the best game we can with the cards that we've been dealt. So two important things to keep in mind here. Remember we said that all grant recipients need to follow the purpose the grant was approved for. When that grant check is cashed, you agree to that purpose in any special terms. And secondly, LOF is mission driven. Always remember that. We want the faithful in our diocese to have access to, to be aware of, and to participate in excellent faith formation programs. So when you put those two things together, um, if you find yourself in a bind with your LOF grant, let us know. Send us an email, give us a call, let us know what's going on. We can help you decide what to do. We probably have had that experience before given our 22 years of grant history. 
We try to have your back so that you can play your best hand when life gets in the way of your grant funded program. And we do this in a number of ways, all which require written approval by the Legacy of Faith Office. So you can request grant changes and grant extensions. So grant changes would be for things like uh, a new program date or a timeline, a new presenter, or if you need to change direction with the program, you can always request those grant changes. The other thing is grant extensions, and those are helpful when you can't complete the program or spend all the money before the end date of June 30th. You can extend your due date out into the future. Uh, grants can also be declined or returned to Legacy of Faith in full or whatever monies are left over. And none of these actions have a negative influence on future grants that you may want to submit. We appreciate your honesty, honesty and accountability in following the grant guidelines. So what if your program's a flop? Well, that happens too. We still wanna hear from you in your grant evaluation. A program that disappoints can still be a good learning tool. We want you to be successful. All right, moving on to the grant evaluation. Uh, why do we need evaluations? Well, very simply, they help us to know if our grant making program is on track. We use the evaluation to assess the effectiveness of our grants and to guide us in future funding decisions. Remember, we said earlier that our greatest charge is to be good stewards of the mission. Evaluations are one tool that helps us to understand the impact of the programs that we're funding. Are the programs that we're funding helping to foster the Catholic faith? Are they making a difference? How do they impact the faithful? Are people attending the programs and are they growing in their faith? Grants and grant evaluations then fuel the perpetual nature of legacy of faith. And here I have that blue circle again for you. A grant story well told inspires more gifts and donations, which in turn helps to build up the endowment for increased grant making capacity in the future. We love photos. We love getting photos from you as well as short quotes from people who participate in the program. Stories and photos are concrete, tangible evidence of the good work that you all are doing with your LOF grants. And here in the development office, we can create the magic that turns your story into new donations for Legacy of Faith. You've heard the phrase, a good picture is worth a thousand words. Well, we use your photos and stories in newsletters, donor letters, website, social media, annual reports, and more. Photos really help us to tell your story succinctly. We can use fewer words when the photo is eye-catching. It's helpful to have a short explanation with each photo of what the people are doing in the photo. We need to know how your program made a difference. And big tip here, please submit photos in the original file format. So the best formats are a JPEG, a PNG, or a TIFF. Um, and we ask that you please don't paste photos, copies into a Word document or a PDF and send those to us. It might upload nicely to your online evaluation form, but they really don't reproduce well. So some of you have probably gotten a phone call from me saying, do you still have the original photo? Can you just forward that to me? So remember, JPEG, PNG, or TIFF formats work best. Um, and these two photos here, this is an example of uh, two photos with just a short little description that really helps tell the story. Now we have a couple of slides with examples from real evaluations that we received that stand out for us. And this one is a good example of an evaluation submitted uh, for the program forms. We picked this one to show you because it demonstrates broad program impact and how it was used across all ages and groups in the parish. It names many specific resources in form that were used. It shows a wide range of groups of people who used it. And it shows a variety of parish groups using the program like for sacramental prep or wedding planning or men's ministry. It also gives specific feedback received from parishioners who use the resource. And then the very last line, I love this, it ends with great resources to strengthen our Catholic faith. 
And that brings that circle to completion. It points right back to the mission of LOF and completes that cycle of gifts and donations, endowment building and grants. Um, here's an example of a very honest and forthright report that shows how even though the result of the program didn't live up to expectations, there was still some benefit and there's hope and enthusiasm for continuing to use that resource in the future. The grant was used to purchase a Lighthouse Catholic Media kiosk, uh, but it didn't get as much use as hoped because church attendance had dropped. And it goes on to explain that those who did use the kiosk found it helpful and explains how they will continue to use it in the future. All right, we're nearing the end of our presentation. So here's a little recap. Uh, first of all, we learned the mission of LOF to preserve and foster the Catholic faith in the Upper Peninsula. We learned a little about the history of the early years of LOF, how it was created and forever led by the Bishop of Marquette. We learned about the perpetual nature of LOF, that continuous cycle of growth through gifts and donations, endowment building and asset investment and grant making that inspires people to invest in LOF through donations. We reviewed some updates to this year's online application and what makes for a good grant application. We also learned what makes a good evaluation, including the importance of photos to help tell the story. As another example, I've included here uh, one of my favorite photos from 2008, a Legacy of Faith grant. I actually um, printed and framed this one and it hangs in my office. Does anyone recognize it? It's from the first diocesan youth rally, P2K. So it sits in my office and it's really a conversation piece. And over the years, I've had so many opportunities to tell this grant story to people who can't who come into my office and admire that photo. So we hope that you found a few good nuggets in today's presentation as you begin to work on your application for the coming year. And we're moving on to Q&A. And I put up here just two frequently asked questions. Um, I've missed my application submission deadline, now what? Well, we're very sorry, but no late submissions are accepted. And we do that out of fairness to all the other people who have submitted their applications on time. Um, and we also disable the application on April 2 so that you really can't even submit it. However, you know, we said life happens. So exceptions are occasionally made when there's an extenuating circumstance. So as always, we invite you to contact us to discuss your situation and inform us of your needs. The second question we get a lot is, can I apply for things like salaries? What about textbooks or new technologies? The best answer I can give you is sometimes. So as we said earlier, Legacy of Faith is intended to enhance and expand parish offerings, but typically everyday operating expenses like salaries, textbooks, computers, we consider that to be part of the parish 25% funding, those regular ongoing operating expenses. However, if these things are preventing you from offering quality faith formation programs, then we want to know that and we want to help. And now I'm gonna um, turn it over to Denise and see if we have received any questions in the chat that she can read to us. Um, no, we haven't, um, but we welcome them. And if, if you want to, you could, um, I don't know if you can raise your hand, but put it in the chat. Let me know and you can unmute yourself because I would love to be able to answer any questions anybody might have. One of the things that uh, as Terry was going through that caught my mind while you're, you're um, putting in your questions or asking is, um, and Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, when you're putting together a grant application, it's very helpful if you don't combine two programs in one, because then it becomes difficult for us to discern and pull them apart. So am I, am I right on that, Terry? Yes, yeah, we ask you to submit separate applications for each program, and there's actually a spot on the application where you can rank priority order. So let's say you want to do three programs that you're applying funding for. We ask you to rank them one, two, and three on your, your 
priority order because many times we can fund one or two, but not always all three of them. And that's perfect because Jim Coscanini asked that, talking about the approach to multiple applications from one parish. I think you just addressed that, Terry. Mm -hmm. So um, I, one, I, I, thing, one thing our committee has kind of been consistent with over the years is we typically don't fund more than three programs for a single parish in any one year. We just kind of feel like that's, that's about the max that most parishes would be able to do. So it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just kind of what the experience has been. Right. Um, Josie from St. Joe and the Sioux asked, are all forms provided after, after the grant is awarded? That is the evaluation form, the deadlines, et cetera. I would say, yes, they are. When you get your grant acceptance letter, and Carrie, interrupt me if I'm incorrect, you're going to get that evaluation link right then and there, you know, with the deadline. I would also recommend that for me, at least when I've had to do things like this, as soon as the program is done, it's always easiest to do the evaluation form right then and there instead of waiting till the deadline. Carrie, am I right on on that? Yeah, a good point. And the um, evaluation forms are digital, they're online. So we make those available to you right after we award the grant, uh, you should be able to go online. Uh, one thing to uh, remember is your grant number. So when we send you the award letter, we attach a grant number to it. And that might be how it's listed in the drop down menu um, because multiple, you know, a parish may receive more than one grant. So that grant number is, is um, an important thing for you to reference. And, and if you're calling me or Denise with questions about a particular grant that you've received, it's really helpful to us if you can reference that grant number. That, that's right. And I think um, I, I have another question here um, from uh, St. Gregory, Don and St. Uh, St. Gregory. What if you're writing a grant that benefits the whole diocese, like a the Catholic summer camp? You know, as Terry said, your grant must benefit your faith formation program. And Terry always interrupt me. I think that if I misspeak, that's what we want to see. We want to see grants that are benefiting big groups in the diocese, not just one particular parish if possible. Yes, that happens, but I think it, it as Terry says, makes it rise to the top if you are benefiting more. So it's not a particular uh, parish faith formation program, but it is a diocesan wide faith formation program, such as Catholic summer camp. I mean, totus to us, that example she showed um, about how those parishes in the vicariate. So yes, we encourage that. So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Any comments, Terry? Yep, great answer. Thank you, Denise. Okay, um, Allie from, St. John and, and St. Joseph in Ishpeming. So she's from joint parishes. And what if we want, uh, what if we want to do a program put on by both parishes? What would that application look like? Terry, I'm gonna let you address this one. So uh, you can do that, absolutely. And, and the sharing of resources, especially between sister parishes is always encouraged. And one of the parishes needs to be the one to submit the grant application. So fiscally responsible, that's the parish that we would communicate back and forth with. We would send the grant check to. So one of the two has to be responsible for the grant. And on the application form, there is a question that says, is this a collaborative grant? Meaning, are you joining with another parish? And you can answer yes. And then there should be a drop down menu there, and you can select the other parish or parishes that you are collaborating with on that grant. Right. And, you know, Allie, that, this is a good thing because we know that you have one pastor shared with those two parishes. So it makes it easier. And, you know, it, like I said, rise to top. Okay, let's see. Josie again has a question. What about receiving funds for our Catholic answer Bibles and catechisms for our ICIA students? Would that be something we would request? Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, but I said absolutely. It's not just about our children's programs or about retreats. It's about faith formation of your parish as a whole. And those, though our RCIA people, that's critical. They're going to keep us going and, and people that are coming to the faith. 
and to the one true church. So yes, correct, Terry? Yes, and one thing to keep in mind too is we really want to benefit lifelong faith formation for all ages. So in the whole pile of grant applications that we have each year, we really try to give a good cross section, not only geographically across the diocese, but also age-wise. So we tend to get a lot of application for children's programs. So if you can commit, uh, submit something that is for adults, that's always going to help you float to the top two of your application so that we get, um, again, that whole spectrum of all ages. 